Rahato Sama Sambudasa Nama Tasa Bakuato Rahato Sama Sambudasa Nama Tasa Bakuato Rahato Sama Sambudasa Hamid to him somebody has a phone on or something i don't know either that it was a long sneeze <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so <clears throat> we look at the bojanga samyutta tonight i don't know how far we're going to go into this but the bojanga samyutta is really about the enlightenment factors. Now, these enlightenment factors are seven things that you want them to get into perfect balance. And I talk about them like this. There's seven of them like this, okay? And they're going like this. When you're learning to meditate, they're going like this. They're all different. It's kind of like an early computer game and when you're playing the computer game you want the the things that are moving to get into the right balance together and then you can go to the next level that's what it's like now so what are the seven enlightenment factors you need to write this down the first one is called mindfulness the second one is called investigation. The third one is called energy. The fourth one is called joy. The fifth one is called tranquility. The sixth one is concentration level and I'd like to say productive concentration level, or we call this collectedness of mind because we want you not to make a lot of pressure on concentration in this practice, just want you to gently do what we are asking you to do. And the last one is equanimity, balanced, very, very balanced equanimity. <laughs> now, Ever since you first began your meditation practice, you are really working at this, but you don't maybe you don't even know that you are working at this, okay? And you're checking to see where these things are in your meditation practice. So what are we doing when we are meditating? We are attempting to connect a mind and body communication system so that we can communicate with our mind with an intention and the mind or the brain will follow that intention. When we start to boil down what it is we're really doing, uh, the Buddha was teaching uh, bhavana in his training for your meditation. Now, the first time we find the word bhavana, we hear dana sila bhavana. Dana is the generosity, practice of selfless giving, sharing, helping that's the dana practice and then the shishila is the five precepts we know the five precepts and then the first bhavana means development of something so development of mind is what we usually say but this time these days some of the pali scholars have discovered that it also means development of your behavior patterns, your behavior patterns, okay? <clears throat> so a person who comes 
to practice may have an anger management problem, but when they learn to practice the uh, metta karuna mudita upeka, this pattern of the Brahma Viharas, then they are going to eliminate lust and greed, hatred and ill will and cruelty, discontent, and they eliminate finally all aversion. And so this is building blocks for you to be able to go down the noble path properly so you can start to experience many, many experiences of tiny nibbanas, if you're practicing the right way, where there's no craving for tiny little spots in the practice cycle. Then you will experience several different times a, a major closing down and turning back on again, and that is a mundane nibbana. So this is what we're trying to learn how to get to the point where you can uh, experience that falling off into cessation of any craving, uh, perception, feeling, or consciousness just briefly and coming back on again. When you come back on, you are actually experiencing a reset of your mind. So it, this is like, in today we can say this way, this is very much like a computer, my computer that has trouble. It's actually me that makes the trouble. But if, when I have trouble sometimes, what do you have to do? You have to reboot your computer, restart the computer. So actually when you press the restart, you are rebooting it. And when it comes back on, it begins to run smoothly again. Okay, after you do that so many times, uh, what is happening is your mind is learning from everything that you are doing in your meditation. And the way that mind learns how to do something that leads to the change in your behavior is if you are teaching it like this, exactly the same way without any changing of how you do it again and again, mind picks up on this and picks it up as a pattern for a new neural pathway in your brain. Okay, so this is the mechanism of how what's going on, how you're doing this. So when you practice dana again and again, the brain starts to pay attention. When you keep your shila and you are not breaking the shila, then uh, the brain is taking in that part also. And the bhavana is the practice, the repetitious practice of moving from unwholesome mind states to wholesome mind states. And the brain likes this. The mind is more comfortable in wholesome states than if it is not in wholesome states. Why? Because it takes all the pressure off of the brain. And when there is no pressure on your brain, then you can get to the proper conditions so you can fall into this deeper, longer, longer cessation, which is actually eventually going to be a super mundane uh, opening for you. And that is what the Buddha, discovered, Buddha experienced when he awakened. Now you remember in the story of the Buddha, if we look back, that the Buddha had gone to um, Alara Kalama and to Ramaputta and had studied with the two, those two teachers before he broke away from the five aesthetics. And he decides to go his own way by changing something. So the question is, what did he change? And so we have evidence in the text in the Majjhima Nikaya, which we, if you ask a question, we can always do this another time. 
but if you go to Sutta number 36 and you start reading at section 30, you will find in the Majjhima Nikaya what it was that happened. And what it was is he let go of basically stress and strain of trying to personally do anything. That is what he did. He let go and decided, uh, I will just watch. I will just observe the arising and the passing away of the phenomena that comes through and comes out around you. When you are observing inside, you are observing in quiet mind level. Quiet mind is uh, sitting, just watching what's happening inside the darkness, not paying attention, personal attention to anything at all that arises, which would stop you from this observation that is totally impersonal. You're watching impersonally, non-judgmentally. This is hard to do. Why is this so hard to do? Because we have our own opinions. <laughs> And many of us want to be the first one to get there, the first one to discover and say, I did it. And that sort of thing has to all go away. In order for you to have this actually happen, there have to be, you are not there. So was Atta and Anatta, if we look at that real quickly for just a minute, we visit it. Was it really about I am or I am not, not really. <laughs> Actually, when there is the belief I am, then I am thinking because I am, everything that occurs in my life is me. Everything I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, it is me, it is mine. It is part of me and who I am. That's very heavy, very heavy. But the opposite of this, if I were to say, anatta is impersonal. What is the consequence of think, seeing, deciding to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and first computation that you make is this is an impersonal process. Whatever is happening, it is arising, it is there, and then it passes away. So that is anicca. And this rising up was uh, the suffering that pulls you away from your pure observation in the deeper states. So the first time we see this bhavana is Dhanashila bhavana. And they said it was for many, many times, many years, development of mind. But now they also say it is development of your behavior patterns. Because if you are practicing right effort correctly and the whole eightfold path is functioning, not a few pieces of it here or there, the whole thing is functioning. All eight pieces are fit together like this and functioning like that, then what happens is you have full support to simply just be, just watch, become just the witness, that's it. And you can get to this condition where you can fall over. Now, <clears throat> there are many pieces in the 37 requisites of enlightenment there are uh, many, which is really the structural uh, teaching, the teaching he wants you to understand. There are many parts in this. Uh, if we just want to understand the 37, we go like this, four foundations of mindfulness, number one, um, four steps of right effort, number two, uh, four, uh, powers, four spiritual powers being developed. That's the third one. Then five faculties, then uh, five powers. And faculties and powers 
you're sitting there saying, why do they say that twice? Because faculties, they develop to a point where they become automatic. So if you were paying attention to faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, when you're developing that and you're paying, watching, what is the wisdom? It's being wise is understanding, I just need to watch how this is all working, how this phenomena is working. I do not need to analyze it. I don't care where it came from. I don't care how long it's hanging around because I'm not going to pay attention to it because the Buddha did told me basically don't do that. So in the Majjhima Nikaya, I'm working with 12 suttas now, and then I'm working with the Bojanga as Samyutta to understand what it is the Buddha was telling people to do about hindrances, disturbances, distractions, obstacles, obstructions, taints, fetters. <laughs> All these words are saying the same thing. Something's coming up, but you have a choice to stay and continue your observation. That's called discipline and patience beyond belief. Patience, lots of patience. Patience is the way to Nibbana. It's this discipline of watching when there's nothing there except the darkness, except there might be. There could be a wave, sound wave that travels through. Could be like the surface of a lake and all of a sudden there's a wiggle on the surface of the lake. Could be like that. But you don't pay attention to anything. You keep just watching, he says. That's all you're doing. You just needed to watch and not do anything except observe. So what are you trying to do? In order for me to do that, if I say that to somebody without them knowing the whole story of what we learn in a retreat, we have to be careful that we remember <clears throat> that we had some foundation things to understand. So we did these four, four, and four, and then we did five faculties, five powers. Now we get to seven factors of enlightenment. And all these things have to be balanced. And the last one is the eightfold path. So you got eight, seven, five, five, four, four, four. That's what you got. That's what you have in the 37. So looking at the Bojanga, once you have done, you have started your practice and practice your generosity and you're using it in life now a little bit too, <clears throat> then what is happening next? You're keeping your sila, you're practicing that way, and then we start you with one spiritual friend. You're working with the spiritual friend, first yourself, then the spiritual friend. Why do I work with myself first? It's really simple. You have to fill the gas tank before you can drive the car. So you can't send any loving kindness to someone sincerely if you don't have any loving kindness for yourself. So you must do it to yourself and be smiling and feeling happy in order to then choose someone and wish for them to feel like you feel too. And that's how this works in the beginning. After you start working with a spiritual friend, let me emphasize something. You do not go back every once in a while and start again with myself and then the spiritual friend. We're missing something in our instructions. We kind of know that now, at least I do over here in India, because a lot of people, uh, of not just Indian people, but everybody seems to be saying, but don't I go back to the beginning and start there? No, you don't need to. You are training the brain to get into this feeling happy from a memory and remembering what it was like and starting to smile. And then you're sending that feeling, but it doesn't mean push, deliver. Ugh, it doesn't mean any of that or apply or anything. It just means wish that person would feel happy like you feel now because you remember that. 
That's all it is. It's not complicated. The whole problem with tranquil wisdom insight meditation is it's too simple. <laughs> and we live in a time where we want to make everything complex and difficult in, and, and lots of parts in it instead of the simple part that was there in the beginning. So it makes it so you block yourself and you don't want to do that, okay? So when you start to work with this and you're sending it to the spiritual friend, you do that until they're smiling back. Now, when they're smiling back, then some things are going to happen where the feeling is going so nicely here in the chest, but it wants to go up in the head. You let it go. Part of what you're doing is setting the body and the mind free to see what will happen if you don't put any pressure on it at all. That is what you are experimenting with. So when it moves from here up into the head, you allow it to do that. Then from there, <clears throat> you will work with other kinds of people. And this part is the, set, the, set, the next stage, this working with other kinds of people is actually a quiz for your brain. Your brain worked with you and allowed you to get happy and allowed you to think about someone else being happy. That's nice and cooperated with you so well, you got the feeling that person was happy to, or you saw them in your mind smile at you. And now we're going to ask you to use some other kinds of people and a guide will guide you through that practice. Once you've gone through this quiz, you do not go back to the beginning. You do not do the other kinds of people again. It was just a quiz. You know, like me giving you a paper with a quiz on Friday at school, and that's all it is, a quiz. Can the brain do that again? In most cases, the brain is ready to do it again and again and again and again to these different kinds of people that are on a little list, okay? And they'll do them one at a time. They'll smile back at you. And at that point, you're pretty, you should be proud of yourself because now your brain is responding to your intentions. So then we take you into a further part where you go to a further level of now we will learn how to properly practice step by step methodically, just the way we've done the rest of this methodically, we will now go to work with the directions. We will start working with five minutes to each direction, okay? And up and down the six directions. Then we will keep doing that from now on when we sit down and go to meditate. It will be your entrance into your meditation practice from that point on. We will then go through the experience and you've gone already through the experience a little bit about going through the levels or the stages of cessation as you're going down the path of the jhanas, which are saying levels of understanding about cessation of different things that cause suffering, gradually you are letting them go deeper into the states, the four rupa jhanas, and then through the four, the, the four uh, mental jhanas, arupa jhanas, okay? The rupa jhanas, you can feel your body. The arupa jhanas, you're losing feeling in your body. Why am I losing feeling in my body, sister came up? Because you're smiling more, you're letting things go, and the tension and the tightness is falling off, falling away. Your brain is beginning to understand because you're doing this the same way every time. It's beginning to understand. Ah, now we want to live life by smiling and letting go and relaxing and coming back to what we are watching. As we are watching through the Arupa Jhanas, the things are interesting in each level, but when you get at the deepest levels, then what is happening is there's less and less to watch. That can really irritate people. <laughs> and people get irritated because 
I always want to see something. If there's nothing for me to watch, how will I watch it, Sister came up Because I want you to just watch. Just watch and don't pay any attention to it. The key to understanding the hindrances is that they have no information for you. No secrets how to make any of this happen faster. No information for you. If you understand that is a law of the hindrances, they have no information for you. The second part about the hindrances is to remember something. In order for something to move, anything that moves must have energy first. In order to have energy, you must have food to build that energy. Energy, the food goes in, the energy starts to grow, the heat rises, and then something moves. This includes the attention that you move away to look at a hindrance. It includes that. And so we need to know how do we stop that? We need to know what is the food. That's the base, isn't it? That's the base of it. The food comes and then produces the energy, gets going, and the heat makes the movement of my attention go over here to a hindrance instead of just closing my eyes and watching inside. Now, there's a secret of, not really a secret, but the way the Buddha figured out how to make all of this happen very smoothly and let go, relax and smile and come back. He realized that there was something that was happening like this heat rising and with the heat rising, there is tension that moves the attention over there. And so he's asking you to let go as quickly as possible. And this is important because if you practiced Vipassana before you practice TWIM, you are lucky. Because why? Because you are sensitive to what happens as sensations in the body. Mostly we were paying attention outside the body. Now we're going to the heart of the whole challenge in understanding the mind. We are going to the object most important. We are the subject. There's usually an object we're watching, but the Buddha, what a genius. The Buddha switched the game. The Buddha made the subject the object. Do you understand? So we're teaching you a higher level of practice in meditation where you are only going to actually look into the mind is the last object when you get to the seventh and eighth jhanas. You are sitting in equanimity. You are sitting in quiet mind. You are there and you can sit for very long like that. But what has to happen last is Bojanga. Bojanga, the seven factors of enlightenment must come into alignment for the condition to be right for you to fall into cessation. We do not go to cessation, push a button and order the elevator up so that we can get in and go down into cessation. We do not make cessation happen. In fact, in the very beginning of training, I try to explain if you want it, you cannot have it. That is a fact. If you want what happened yesterday to happen again in your practice, you cannot have it. 
do you know why? Because I want it. I desire it. You're creating heat. You're demanding. You're pushing. You're putting pressure on the brain. To fall into cessation, what must happen is there is no tension. A, just a tiny bit for a moment. It's all gone. And that's when you fall over into cessation. But in order for it to happen, these seven pieces must be aligned together. So I'm going to read to you a little bit about this. And much of what is in Bojanga is talking to you about hindrances and about the enlightenment factors. You thought you were coming here just to hear about the enlightenment factors. But the Bojanga turns out to be entirely dedicated to explaining hindrances in relation to it, the Bojanga. So if we look at the first one we'll read is from the beginning, the mountain, the Himalayas, at Sawati, monks based upon the Himalayas, the king of the mountains, the Nagas nurture their bodies and they acquire strength. And when they have nurtured their bodies and acquired strength, then they enter the pools and from the pools, they enter the lakes and then the streams and then the rivers. Finally, they enter the ocean. There they achieve greatness, expansiveness of body. So too, monks based upon virtue, your Sheila, established upon virtue, the monk develops and cultivates the seven factors of enlightenment. And thereby he achieves greatness and expansiveness in wholesome states. And how does this monk, how does this student based upon virtue, established upon virtue, develop the seven factors of enlightenment? Here, monks, a monk develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion within oneself can you pause this for just a minute Bunty? first what, what is going on and how does a person based upon virtue established upon virtue they're standing on virtue develop the seven factors of enlightenment here they develop the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion. This is seclusion in oneself sitting and meditating. Doesn't mean you have to be secluded in a retreat. Doesn't mean you have to isolate yourself away from everything. It means that you can be secluded to yourself and what you're doing in your meditation. Dispassion and cessation maturing in release. At this point, what is happening is you have gone through a, a partial, uh, an experience of disenchantment with other things that have to do with acquisition, that have to do with unwholesome mind states, actions, involvement, um, heavy metal music, you know, and, uh, and stuff that is really loud and stuff like that. So in order to mature to a release, you need to be as quiet in a, in a quiet place, but not totally quiet because you understand something. And that is that you understand sound is just a sound. So by the time you reach these states, no one should be disturbed by sound. They shouldn't be disturbed even by a big bang or a thunder, thunder lightning thing or two cars crashing on the street. It just shouldn't bother them if they heard something. It simply was a shaking 
of the mind and and then it went away because all things that arise pass away in anicca he develops the light the enlightenment factor of his investigation in the same way based on seclusion dispassion and cessation maturing and release and he develops his enlightenment factor of uh, his um, his energy, his joy, and his tranquility, and his level of concentration. As you're working on your concentration, you always are attempting to reach a productive level of observation, of concentration with the least amount of pressure in your mind where you're just able to watch. Just watch, okay? Um, and equanimity. And equanimity is just what we're talking about, is the stability, the uh, non, non-concern, because you know that everything that's happening is impersonally happening around you and you simply let go of concern when you're, when you're watching like this. And the, um, in this way, based upon virtue, he establishes the virtue developing the seven factors of enlightenment and thereby he achieves a greatness and expansiveness into wholesome states. Meaning that you are sitting very quietly uh, into like the evening by a lake or an, a very big lake. And this quietness in the lake uh, is so silent and still. Everything is absolutely still. You know, fish, they don't bother the water. They don't make ripples or anything on the water in the evening. They're only eating at sundown. That's the only time, early in the morning and sundown when the bugs are starting to fly in the evening, that's when they're going to, to eat. But then it, it's, they're very, they stop eating and everything on the surface of the water becomes like glass, very still. The inside of your mind is like the stillness of the lake in the evening. And it's only with wholesome states what you're doing. And then it says, the second one is telling you concerning the body. Just as the body sustained by nutriment subsists in dependence on nutriment and does not subsist without nutriment, so too we must understand the five hindrances sustained by nutriment subsist in dependence on nutriment and do not subsist without nutriment. Great way to start this section of the Samyutta Nikaya. Totally dedicated to making you understand if you feed a hindrance, it's going to stick around because you're feeding it. So let's go further. And what is the nutriment of the arising of unarisen sensual desire? And what causes the increase and expansion of this arisen sensual desire? This is the sign of the beautiful and frequently giving careless attention to the beautiful. It is nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of arisen sensual desire. So what's it talking about? Just beautiful thing. You know, but what happens today is people grab a hold of something like this and say, I can't look at anything anymore. I can't, if I'm a Buddhist, I can't look at a beautiful flower blooming. I can't look at a beautiful, uh, a beautiful, meaningful uh, film that's a story uh, of, of, you know, Mandela in Africa or the story of Baba Sahib or anything. I can't do that. Just looking at the beautiful something sight, that's not correct. It is, you are perfectly able to look at something without desire. You have the system to let go, relax, smile, and come back to simply watching. It's simply saying, don't get involved with anything that is beautiful or even obsess on something that is ugly. Don't do that either because any obsession, any fixation is involving Craving is involving, clinging. And these are things you are attempting to let go of. Now, at what 
is the nutriment for the rising of the unarisen ill will and for the increase and expansion of arisen ill will. There is the sign of the repulsive, frequently giving careless attention to it, is the, the nutriment for the arising of unarisen ill will and for the increase and expansion of the arisen ill will. So this was tit for tat. <laughs> Don't get involved with this when you see it. It's nice to walk down a path and see a beautiful orchid, to smell it and say, that's nice. And can you walk past it and let it go? Not thinking again about it, having gone through that in that present time, and now you're walking into this present time. So you're moving all the time. So in these depths, we are sitting. When we are sitting deeply, we must pay attention. We do not fixate on anything we witness. We just witness. Whatever occurs is there, goes away. We're only going to witness. This is what we need to pay attention to. But it's not to be taken as an extreme. Again, you understand. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sloth and torpor for the increase and expansion of the arisen sloth and torpor? Sleepy, dull mind. What is happening? There are, there, the reasons are discontent, lethargy, lazy stretching, drowsiness after too much eating at meals, sluggishness of our mind, yeah? Too much pizza, mm. <laughs> too much. And then you get sluggish. Or if we think in America, when we have Thanksgiving deal, it's kind of sad because the turkey, if there's a turkey that you're eating, turkey makes you sleepy. So always when there's a big meal, everybody wants to just hang out and just, nah. <laughs> you know, they could just go to sleep. It's from the, Turkey is giving you that. That turkey meat is giving you that. <laughs> so it's drowsiness from overeating or eating something that has something in it that wants to make you just, ah, I don't want to move. This is why light, moderate eating is better. And when we're older, small meals a few times a day isn't bad for us because when we're older, that is better for our system. So frequently giving careless attention to these things is the nutriment. Once again, giving your attention to it is careless attention. Now you hear this reflected all through the entire Gojanga. Careless attention causes the hindrance to stay longer and stronger and bigger and come back for more because you're basically serving it the favorite meal of the day, personal attention. So then we have sloth and torpor for the increase and expansion of the arisen sloth and torpor. That's how you, you would do it. So this is the nutriments for the hindrances. The next one is, what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen restlessness and remorse? And for the increase and expansion of the arisen restlessness, guilt, and remorse. When you start to think about these things, when you start to feed them, you're feeding them attention, they get bigger and they start to spin in, in a lot of little circles of dependent origination, like a, like a, I told you, it's like a slinky. You know, the wire just keeps going around like this. You're feeding it to spin and keep going, the wheel. And so by mental proliferation, proliferating your brain with thoughts and thoughts and thoughts about how bad that was, you see? Thoughts and thoughts and thoughts about what I should have done or could have done or would have done, you see? If only, but that's in the past. And so we try in our retreats to give you a lesson on the present, the past, and future, so that you can very closely um, scrutinize exactly what is the past, 
what is the future and what is the present time? And can we live our life by letting go of putting in our mind the past events and let go of the future? Worries when it's not here yet, we don't know what it will be, yeah? That's what is important to understand. So this is how we uh, frequently giving careless attention to this restlessness, this guilt or this remorse that we're going through. That is the nutriment for the arising of any unarisen restlessness, guilt or remorse. And for the increase and expansion, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger if we keep giving it attention. Very, very clear. Then the last is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen doubt for the increase and expansion of that doubt. And there are things that are the basis for doubt, frequently giving a careless attention to them. Again, is the nutriment, is the food for the arising of unarisen doubt and for the increase and expansion of arisen doubt, just as the body sustained by nutriment subsists in dependence on nutriment, does not subsist without nutriment. And so too, the five hindrances sustained by nutriment subsist in dependence on nutriment and do not subsist without nutriment. We cannot be more clear than this. We cannot be more clear than this. I do not understand how anyone in meditation today can be suffering from hindrances if this is taught this is just the first one in here there are pretty good amount it's pretty good um amount of lessons in Jenga. yeah and um it's telling you it's i think it's about 69 70 of them and basically it is all talking basically about this main problem, this difficulty that is happening from hindrances, which are disturbances, who are distractions, which have been obstacles that became obstructions. They tried to stop us <laughs> and are also called taints and also fetters that catch and hold us. And all we had to understand was what feeds them. Now, I take you back for a minute to Majima Nikaya number 128. And in the paragraph, almost at the very end of that, we find something the Buddha is telling us about the trick to all of this, you see? how to really remember what this is. And we go to the end of the Upakale Sasuta, he gives it away. And by the way, there's 11 or 12 hindrances over here in this one. And he says, when Anaruta asks him, well, what did you do? What did you do about it? When he tells him all about all the different things that happened to him in his meditation and try to prevent him from becoming the Buddha. What does he tell Anuruddha? I understood that the hindrance is an imperfection of the mind and had abandoned that hindrance and imperfection of the mind. Mm -hmm. When I understood that inattention is the imperfection of the mind, he goes to 11 of them and says it the same way. So he's basically saying, when I understood something is an imperfection of my mind. What do I do with it? Do I hold on to it? Like a hot coal and just let it burn me? So you guys and girls who are here, you're getting the actual thing about the hindrances. Let's look at the next piece here in this one the nutriments for the enlightenment factors. 
how are we going to give them help to come up? What is the nutriment for the enlightenment factor to arise? You can probably guess it, but let's read it. Just as this body sustained by nutriment subsists in dependence on nutriment and does not subsist without its nutriment, so too the seven factors of enlightenment sustained by nutriment subsist in dependence on their nutriment and do not subsist without nutriment. What was the nutriment? What was it? Me. My attention on that, that is the food for the hindrance. Then it goes through. What is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness, the first, my, the first uh, factor? And for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness, what is that? There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of mindfulness. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of an arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness. And for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness. You know what mindfulness is. It is your observation skill. If it's too sluggish, slow, weak, not enough energy in it. If that's not happening, then it slips. It's not a sharp awareness anymore. Then you get bored with what we're asking you to watch. And what is a nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states, it means investigation of interstates, and of the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of these states. Wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior, dark and bright states with their counterparts. Frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states and for the fulfillment of the development of the arisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states. Now, what this shows you is the two sides. It's talking about wholesome and unwholesome state. Too much wholesome, little bit back here, please, so we can get balanced, little less, please. Too much unwholesome, little bit back here, please, to this. So it's basically saying that their counterparts bring them into balance. It's like a scale, it's like this. You're playing in a very fine realm. You are sitting in a very refined kind of observation. This is very important to understand. And if it's blamable or it's blameless, that you're talking about either side, your mental proliferation needs to be turned off. You're talking about inferior or superior states. You need to not talk about either of them and be balanced. It's asking you to balance the scale. Balance everything. Do you remember what I told you in the beginning? Here are the seven pieces. They need to get like this before they can fall over. They cannot get there if there's too much here or here or there or there. There is a lovely diagram. I wish that I could show you this. I should have turned the other computer on tonight because I finally fixed it. Um, there's a lovely way of putting a picture like this. So you make a triangle like this first, okay? Like that on the page. And then you put a seesaw across it, across it on the top, uh, like a piece of a board that runs across, okay? Now in, the, in, this, uh, in this triangle, you put mindfulness. 
because mindfulness is what will help you to balance the scale. Now it's a teeter-totter and the teeter-totter has two sides like this and it's working on top of the triangle, okay? The support. Now on this side over here, we have investigation, energy, and joy. And on this other side over here, we have when joy fades away, tranquility arises. That's the tranquility, the opposite, the counterpart for the counterpiece for too, the too much joy and not enough tranquility. So you have tranquility, concentration, productive level of concentration supports a strong mindfulness. Too strong, you cannot, it will break down. Too weak, it will not function correctly. It has to be balanced, okay? So your concentration as to productive level allows you to see and observe in, with patience, with diligence, flexible and malleable, just sitting there watching and nothing more and not feeling pressed or any pressure to do anything more, just watching. So do it again over here investigation, energy, and joy over here, tranquility, okay, concentration, and equanimity. And you're building up your equanimity. That is what's going here. See, that's all the way the balance is working. You got it? Okay. So that's how that's working. So this goes through all seven of these pieces and, and basically is talking to you about the investigation and then it tells you about the energy and let's see what it says about the energy the neutral nutriment for the arising of the enlightenment factor of energy for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy the element of arousal the element of endeavor the element of exertion frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy. Not too much, not too little, just right, just right. That's the game. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of joy and for the fulfillment and development of the joy? And the things are the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy, frequently giving careful attention to them. Is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of joy. They want you to smile. They're saying, please smile. And for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of joy. Not enough. Just smile, that's what they're asking you for. And when is the, what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility? And for its development of the arisen factor of tranquility. Tranquility of body, tranquility of mind. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility. And for the fulfillment of the development of the arising enlightenment factor of tranquility. Now, when they say to you something like tranquility of the body, tranquility of the mind, go back to the Anapanasati instructions. Breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation, breathe out. Tranquilizing bodily formation, breathe in. Tranquilizing the mental formation, breathe out. Tranquilizing the mental formation, okay? One of the things we have to remember is the first verse of the Dhammapada. Mind is the forerunner of all states, mind made are they. Doesn't matter if it's too much or it's too little, too big, too small, too loud, too soft. Mm -hmm. If we think first, body follows. There is a connection between body, between mind and body. So this is basically talking to you about tranquility of the body 
and tranquility of the mind, just remember when you tranquilize your mind, the body will follow. There is no need to stop and scan your body. You continue watching. You do not have to scan your body. You simply intention to your mind to be calm. And the heart, the gastrointestinal system, the lungs, everything starts to relax. The blood pressure goes down. This is how it operates. These are pieces that need to be reconnected together. Okay. Then the next one, arising enlightenment factor concentration uh, for the fulfillment of the development of the arisen enlightenment factor of concentration. Uh, the sign of serenity, the sign of non-dispersal. Non-dispersal, dispersal of your mind from observation leads to mental proliferation and papancha occurring. Frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising and unarisen enlightenment factor of concentration and for the fulfillment and development of arisen enlightenment factors of concentration. And what is the nutriment for the arising and the unarisen factor of equanimity and for its fulfillment? Things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of equanimity. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment. Those things that are the basis for the enlightenment. In the nutriment is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of equanimity and for the fulfillment of the development of the arise, arisen enlightenment factor of equanimity. Just as the body that is sustained by nutriment subsists in dependence on nutriment and does not subsist without nutriment, so to these seven factors of enlightenment sustained by nutriment, subsist independent on nutriment, and they do not subsist without nutriment. So, questions? Questions? Do you get it? <laughs> That's where we should start. Do you get it? The seven pieces, the seven parts of enlightenment, the five hindrances is what's involved is will be survived. We will do this again next week. We'll keep going with this and see what, how far it goes into this more. But there isn't any question about this. It's based on nutriment and understanding. So let me hear your questions. I'm going to write a song about this. Hello out there. Are you there? Because I can't <laughs> see you at all. Hello out there. Come into me and tell me if you're there. <laughs> Norma, what's up? <laughs> I guess the question I have, I don't know if it's a question or, or sort of like a reflection on the on, on this is like um, when because you know I'm, I'm on this kick like meditation is life and life is meditation you know sure. uh, because every, everything has to be applied right sure. to, to not just when you're sitting in seclusion in your living room or whatever but That's also right. when, you're, when you're doing your job in my case when yeah. I'm teaching you know 27 students or the double or triple of that depending yeah. on the day when yeah. um when there when uh, you know you want to keep that equanimity in your mind you know, and you have so many distractions coming at you, you know, one after the other, after, you know, how, I guess the question is like, how long does it take to develop this kind of, um, you know, um, equanimity in such a way that, that it doesn't matter how many times they come at you, you're still equanimous. <laughs> you, you get what I'm talking about? Yeah. How long does yeah. it take to train the brain? Yeah, exactly. So... It depends on how much you apply what we just talked about. So if, for instance, you're getting upset about something, the first thing to do is laugh at it because look at all you've learned. It's impersonal. Whatever just happened is going to arise and pass away. 
I don't mean from morning to lunch and lunch to dinner. I mean, in minutes, seconds, it's gonna be there and gone. The, the thing you have to decide is that you are steering the ship through life. You are at the helm. Now, what we can do for you is point and give you the information about how the ship is operating. But you have to decide, it's up to you. Let it go. This is where, never mind. Look at me, I just got caught, never mind. If you do that a hundred times a day, then it won't bother you anymore. It'll stop. Because you're training your brain, never mind. Let go, relax, I'm keep doing what I'm doing. Let go, you know? You just have to let go of it. So this is training. The, the training system is clear. The neurology is there. The neurocognitive science is there. The information about the nutriment, about how do you actually get your, get your dependent origination seven link chart out and tell me, how do you get annoyed? How do you have anxiety? How does the depression work? How do you get sad? How do you get consumed in worry? How does it happen? Not why, how? And then you back up and you say, obviously uh, these factors are out of alignment. These factors, and you're at a level, I know you, I know you're at a level where you're paying attention to your seven factors of enlightenment. And as you're doing that, check them now. Put yourself a sign in the classroom. Put it up so when the kid, when one of the one of the the people puppies, or as my uncle would call them, the people puppies, <laughs> if the people puppy shows up, or the problem is facing you, first look at how you're feeling. How are you dealing with it? <laughs> See, you have to keep training it and training it. By the way, my system isn't very good, but I did at the window earlier and tonight. <laughs> Not real effective, but I get the kids to quit torturing the dogs. If I go to the window and I tell them, you know, honestly, if you don't stop torturing the dogs, I'm going to come over there with a stick and torture, you know, like poke you and see how you feel. But when dog puppies are surrounding me right here now, screaming in pain, not just barking or whining or chasing one dog away, screaming in pain. Okay, fine. I have to say, okay, fine. <laughs> because there's nothing we can do to make this all different here. It's one of the reasons I don't really want to stay here anymore, but I probably will <laughs> for a while, you know. But I wish, I wish that people would wake up. And as I told you earlier, my difficulty with these dogs is I know what they're saying. <laughs> you can take that or leave it, but I know what they're saying. So it's a very difficult situation. But when you're at school, if kids come in and they're harassing or they're fighting, I know you're faced with disciplinary things and that's difficult. I know that, but if you can't, uh, you can't just let it take you over. You know what I'm saying? You have to stay balanced. Yeah. And, and you have to take care of yourself. This is really important. I mean, I've known teachers who were in your kind of situation end up having a heart attack and that's the end, you know? You, you can't let this bother you. If there's no way for the administration to help you and parents are not going to come sit down and say, there's a real problem here. If you're not dealing with that group of people, you have to make some decisions to protect yourself. That's, that's about the only way you have to look at this. You know? Yes, absolutely. So, no, I... I no, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think that that, that having reminders probably is the, the best thing to do, you know, in this case, because I, of course, I know what I need to do. You know, like I've been 
training with you already for almost two years. Yeah. And so, so I know what I need to do is just more about training that reminder. And I think that the, just like we do for the kids, you know, like we put these posters for the kids so that they can remember things. I think I need to need to put posters for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's absolutely yeah. true. I mean, this is yeah. not funny. When I was training with Monty, you know, I was living in a small trailer. And I lived in that trailer 25 feet long, eight feet wide for seven years. Of course, when you open the door, I have the whole forest. So my house is pretty big because I have the whole forest and I have the, the porch out in front of my trailer. But the point was, that's my living space. So when I lay down at night, I mean, the ceiling's right above me, you know? So I had things pasted up there that I was learning. I had them on the wall. I had them on the door into the bathroom. I had them on the door as I was leaving. I was telling myself constantly, constantly, constantly these things because I wanted to see what happens. How long does it take to actually drill this into my brain? In most cases, it's there. In most cases, I've been known to walk up to people and very gently explain things, but in, I'm at a disadvantage here. I don't feel like I can do that, uh, you know, but, the, but the, um, the basic attitude, I understand the attitude, I understand where it came from, but I still can't get myself to the place where I can forgive it forever uh, because this is the main concern here where I live is survival, survival first before anything else, yeah? Before you take care of the cow, you take care of the people. Before you take care of the goat uh, or, or the dog or anything like that, you have to take care of the people. And people are working really, really, really hard. And they're coming home totally and completely exhausted in this neighborhood, you know? And so you, you see the reality of this. We would get upset in the West if we saw the situation, but we're not seeing the whole situation. When you are pressed against the wall where survival is everything first, then how can you blame them for not having an SPCA for the dogs or a no-kill uh, retrieval system where we could go through the neighborhood and pick up 50 dogs and put them in a place and have somebody give us money to take care of them, it isn't going to happen. So, so you, you, you have no, um, no way of controlling. And, but that goes all the way through all of society. If, if a Westerner comes and looks at the situation, they have no idea how it is to live here in, in this, in this level of living when survival is the very first thing that has to happen. You see what I mean? Yes, in this case, dogs comes completely second to what people feel their survival is. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, so there you're, you're between a rock and a hard place. The only thing you can do is try to teach children Dogs can feel, I mean, once I had a, a, a woman tell me, why are you worried about the dogs? They don't feel anything. That's the knowledge level. Dogs don't smile. They're just dogs. Do you see the problem? <laughs> yeah. So you have to deal with it. But what you deal with it is by just making sure that when you have extra food that you put in in a bowl where somebody can come and get something to eat and that there's water when it's really hot like this, putting an extra bowl of water out somehow so that nobody will steal the bowl and the dog will have, some dogs will be able to come and get some water, clean water, but we, what can we do? But when, so you, you have to do what you can do and you have to protect yourself. And in your case, I think a lot of it is learning to look at alternative things about how maybe they can handle things, the kids with each other. Maybe playing with the Four Noble Truths in terms of um, there is, there is uh, suffering and discontent that's happening here. 
and taking turns talking about what you think really the cause of it is. What is the cause of it? Letting them talk about it, not you, but you can do this with yourself too. And then looking at what would it be like if there was a cessation to this? How would it make you feel? How, how would you describe or paint for me a cessation of these kinds of issues? And then ask them directly, how would you fix this so everybody can learn music and learn math and, and be happier at school? Put them to the test as far as using those in a non-Buddhist way. I was fixing families in Missouri at one point, <laughs> um, a woman who had, um, six children or seven children and some of them were married with their children she had 12 people in the house nobody was lifting a finger to help her she met a man and was very happy about meeting someone didn't have an ounce of time because of that finally thought she was just going to leave but she wanted to fix the family so i gave her the recipe for arbitration Buddhist style, but it didn't make it Buddhist. This is a way to share what we know and what we've learned about wholesome and unwholesome because everybody got a piece of paper in that house who could write and they wrote down what they saw the challenge as being. What was the suffering? You're asking them to write down what the way that it's disturbing you the most. You didn't have to call it suffering what's disturbing you the most mentally and physically here, or what do you see as the biggest challenge? The second question, when you fold the paper, you take a paper, you know, you take the paper and you fold it in half like this. And on this side, you say, what is the challenge? And you open this up and turn it over. Now on this side, you say, what do you think the cause of this is? Honestly, what do you think the cause of this whole thing is? And then the next page here, you flip it again. So only you see this page, right? And you say, what do you see the solution being here? You know what? Maybe it could be true. Maybe that they um, actually have the solution themselves. Okay. Um, maybe they have the solution, but that, but the faculty doesn't know it. Maybe the faculty doesn't see it could be. And then what you need to do is come up with a plan. If you see they are writing, in this case, those kids and the parents, they were writing different things. And she took it all together. And she and her friend, they sat down to try to figure out how it could be that they could all continue to use the house and stay there. And um, I think it was one or two of the couples decided to leave. There were only six or six people left in the end, but when they went away for the weekend to look at the papers, when they came back, they had cleaned up the yard, cleaned up the fence, started to paint the fence, repair the shutters, fix the doors and clean up the house. They got the message. And the thing is, if kids are growing up today, what do they really want? They want a Begalini car or a Ferrari car. They have these big dreams about a Tesla car and everything like that. So do they want to live in a world full of trash and dumpsters and just stuff like this is what, because where you are, how you're living, what you're accepting as your neighborhood, my street is very clean. We're really lucky here. Everybody cares about the street that we live on. It's not like that surrounding me though. But when, where you live, what, how you decide to live, even if you only have one room, determines who you are and what you're gonna have come to you in the future. And that's real. So if they have dreams about being on their own and becoming an entrepreneur and being rich and all the rest of it, they need to start thinking about it right now. You know, You can actually find ways to maybe show them in stories or stuff, how that works. I don't know. I'm just trying to feed you ideas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's correct. Sarma, did you have a question? No, no. 
No? You okay with the enlightenment factors okay? Yeah? Okay. Way to go. Okay. Everybody okay? So are we ready to stop? Anybody got any questions? Last call. Huh? Okay, let's put a closing. Bunty? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving may shed all grief and may all, and beings, all beings find relief. relief. May all beings, may all beings share this merit that we have, that thus, we have acquired thus acquired for the acquisition, the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. happiness. May beings, beings inhabiting space, space and, and earth, devas, devas and, and nagas of mighty power, share, share this, this merit of ours. May they long, may they long protect. The Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you for joining us. Please um, 